First, let me look at um, the importance of spinal injury in terms of numbers of people who suffer this sort of injury in the UK. There's about 10 to 15 people for every million population each year, which means, roughly speaking, there's something between 600 and 1,000 people with a spinal injury each year in this country, which is a, a large number of people who need a, an awful lot of rehabilitation and assistance. And they're mainly younger men, and the, and the commonest age is similar in the 20s to 40s. And perhaps not surprisingly, most, about 40%, are from car accidents, but we shouldn't forget spinal injury can also occur after falls, perhaps in the elderly more commonly, after sporting injuries increasingly these days, and industrial accidents and assaults. So let's have a briefly look at the anatomy. The spinal cord is a bundle of nerves that leaves from the brain through the spine, in the middle of the spine, and what's called the spinal canal. In other words, it's surrounded by the vertebrae, by bones, so it's well protected. The, the bundle of nerves largely consists of motor nerves. They're the nerves that control movement. They move the arms, move the legs, control the chest muscles. But in addition to that, there are sensory nerves, nerves that supply feeling from the arms and the legs and the chest back up to the brain. And also the nerves controlling the bowel and bladder and sexual functioning travel in the spinal cord, so those functions can also be affected. Basically, if there's damage to the spine, it can sometimes cause no damage to the spinal cord, but often a crushed vertebrae or a slipped vertebrae or a fractured vertebrae can damage the spinal cord that is traveling near that area. And function below that area is therefore affected, sometimes completely or sometimes partially. If the damage is at the bottom end of the spine, for example, in the so-called sacral region, the only things that can be affected sometimes are just the bowel and bladder function or sexual functioning. If the damage is a little bit higher up in the lumbar region, then the leg function begins to be affected as well. Until we're up to the thoracic region in the chest, where if there's damage there, then there's no leg function below that level and no bowel or bladder or sexual function. And of course, we come up to the neck, then the arm begins to be affected as well, right up to the damage at the top end of the neck, the top end of the cervical vertebrae as they're called, and if there's damage at that area, then you have no functioning at all in arms or legs, or bowel or bladder or sexual function. And of course at that level, the diaphragm is also affected, so people need to be breathed for, they can't breathe for themselves, because the diaphragm and the chest muscles are affected. So it's the level of damage to the spine that causes the, the disability. And we know roughly from the level of the spine what the damage is likely to be in the longer term. We also can determine the areas of loss of sensation, which is important after spinal injury, because a loss of sensation means you can't feel your legs, you can't feel your bottom, and that in turn uh, gives rise to problems of, for example, pressure sores, or difficulties with minor damage to the legs or the skin. Ingrowing toenails even cause a problem because you can't feel them. So basically, the level of the damage determines the level of the final functioning. In the short term, the, the key is to stop further damage to the spinal cord. So you'll see at sports events or by the roadside, for example, the paramedics uh, immobilizing the neck in a brace and lifting the person very carefully onto a stretcher. And that should minimize the risk of either causing spinal damage in the first place or, or reducing the chances of further damage if it's already been damaged. Unfortunately, spinal injuries are often associated with other problems such as broken bones. Indeed, six out of ten people with a spinal injury have other injuries as well. So, how do we manage spinal injury? And best course of action is to refer someone as quickly as possible to one of the 12 spinal injury centres in the UK or Ireland. That's where the experts lie, that's where the expert treatment can be given. What they will do is to either reduce the fracture, in other words, stabilize the spine to stop any further damage. Um, that's a surgical approach, if you like. Another school of thought is that actually the spinal injury should be managed conservatively. So you don't operate to stabilize the spine, you let nature do the job. And there are two schools of thought, and probably both have uh, some merits. For example, surgical treatment will enable the person to get up and, and about more readily, whereas conservative treatment will tend to involve more bed rest well, whilst nature is healing the spine. The long-term disability depends on time. Sometimes it's a very short-term damage, 
so-called spinal shock. People can improve quite quickly. Sadly, that's not always the case, or even quite rarely the case, and the damage only repairs itself very slowly, over a period of perhaps one to two years. And of course, uh, the spine doesn't repair itself very well or very efficiently, so there's often long-term problems. The amount of long-term problems also depends on whether the spinal damage is complete or partial. A complete transection of the spinal cord is probably not recoverable at the moment in our state of knowledge, and every function below that level is affected. But sometimes the damage can be partial, and you've got some residual function below the level of the damage. And you need to know that, because uh, that will determine the eventual level of recovery. So recovery mainly occurs over 6 to 12 months, but as I've said, can be longer. But important to remember that rehabilitation can help at any time. Uh, so people really do need to get to a, a rehabilitation centre quickly. But if there's been delay, uh, and people have perhaps gone home too soon or too early, then rehabilitation can still assist even later. And we should remember, of course, that these are generally young men, and these days, life expectancy after a spinal injury is nearly normal. And in most people it is normal, whereas a few years ago, people tend sadly died early from spinal complications. So good rehabilitation has made a dramatic difference to the amount of recovery and the efficiency of that recovery. Let's have a look at some of the problems after spinal injury. First, respiratory problems or chest problems. Damage to the thoracic spine, the middle part of the spine, can lead to weakness of the chest muscles, causing difficulty breathing and difficulty coughing, which can in turn lead to chest infections. Lesions higher up in the neck in the high cervical region can lead to the diaphragm being paralysed, which then really means you can't breathe, either effectively or at all, and you might need ventilation. High cervical lesions are therefore more prone to having chest infections and need expert, not only ventilator advice, but input, regular, ongoing input, from a, for a physiotherapist and eventually from the family who should be taught physiotherapy exercises. So respiratory care is really important. We know there's damage to the spine to give rise to sensation problems, so people can't feel below the level of the lesion or feel badly, and that can give rise to a risk of pressure sores, which are avoidable with proper cushioning, proper seating, proper turning, so pressure is relieved on those areas of the skin. Nutrition is a problem sometimes. When things are healing in the body, you need more calories, and sometimes that's not uh, paid enough attention to, and people don't basically eat enough. Sometimes there are other acute problems that the bowel stops working after a spinal injury and so you're not actually absorbing the food. Bowel difficulties are really common uh, and can usually be managed with expert help from a, from a nurse uh, with reflex bowel emptying or digital stimulation or suppositories. So a simple regime is often what's needed but you've got to initiate that simple regime and teach the person and if necessary their family to help with the bowel difficulties. Unfortunately, bladder problems are really common. Commonly, this is a flaccid bladder. In other words, a bladder that fills up with urine but doesn't drain out, and it will need a catheter to help it drain out. Um, indwelling catheters can be used sometimes, but often in spinal injury, it's better to have what's called an intermittent self-catheterization. In other words, the person catheterizes themselves from time to time, perhaps every three or four hours, uh, to drain the bladder. But they do need regular urological follow-up to make sure there's not back pressure on the kidneys and increasing damage both to the bladder and to the kidney functioning. And that's really important to avoid uh, the difficulties of a kidney failure in the long term, which used to be a leading cause of death, but should not be any longer. We've already mentioned sexual function can be diminished very commonly, and there are ways to help sexual functioning, both in men and in women. Deep venous thrombosis can be a risk until people are, are wheelchair mobile and over the a, acute phase. And then actually deep venous thrombosis, DVT, is much less of a risk. If there's been partial damage to the nerves, pain can be a real problem, nerve pain, so-called neuralgic pain. And that can be helped sometimes by better positioning of the person, physiotherapy advice, or it might need special analgesics, uh, painkillers that uh, do well at reducing nerve pain which surprisingly can be anticonvulsants or antidepressants. Nothing to do with epilepsy or depression, but they have a side effect of helping neuralgic nerve pain. And spasticity can be a real issue. S severe, painful muscle spasm, which can just add unnecessarily to the overall disability if it's not um, helped sufficiently by a lot of means, particularly physiotherapy or antispastic drugs or use of botulinum toxin. 
And the last uh, particular difficulty mentioned uh, in terms of physical problems is what's called autonomic dysreflexia. And this is a, a, a difficulty of increasing instability of what's called the autonomic nervous system, which gives rise to um, severe and sudden and, and dangerous increases in blood pressure, causing sweating, headaches, flushing attacks, slowed heart rate. Um, and that can be very serious, but it's very easily treated. It can be triggered by relatively minor things, such as constipation or a full bladder or a kink tube from the catheter. But people will tend to know what causes their particular dysreflexia and they should be able to eventually treat it themselves or be aware of it themselves. And the, core of the treatment is often quite simple, such as sitting up and sometimes needing using a drug called nifedipine or related compounds. So you've got to remember to listen to the person with the problems. They'll know when they're getting this complication, which is a very serious thing. So improvement after spinal injury really depends on the rehabilitation team, the whole team, the skilled spinal team. And key people are the physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, the skilled spinal nurse, and of course the spinal physician or surgeon. Well, there's a lot we can do. Mobility is a key problem, obviously, if the, the legs aren't working efficiently or at all. These days we can use orthotic devices uh, to help people stand. Often people will need good quality wheelchairs, whether it be electric or manual, and able to cope with the, that person's lifestyle. So uh, we need chairs these days perhaps to get over rough ground so people can go back to uh, getting around on, on walking with their family. Or they might need special sports chairs. And these days, of course, there are a whole variety of sports that people can participate in, such as wheelchair rugby or wheelchair tennis. And of course, we need to manage the unnecessary complications of um, immobility, such as those pressure sores which shouldn't occur, or spasticity. So also there's, then we can help arm function if the arm has been affected, could higher cervical lesions, higher lesions in the neck. And we may need a whole variety of adaptations to help, for example, with feeding. Here, an occupational therapist is key. We might need help and advice with uh, dressing, washing, feeding, and of course, bowel and urinary care. And we may need to consider the use of environmental control, so a person who is uh, in a wheelchair or not too accessible or too mobile can control aspects of their immediate environment, such as answering the door or the telephone or switching on and off the lights or the television. And that can all be done very simply and easily these days by environmental control and other modern technology. And we shouldn't also forget that after spinal injury there can be very serious emotional issues. Depression is obviously, uh, but sadly, uh, common after a major change of lifestyle and quality of life. Anxiety can be common. People uh, get difficulty of, of getting out and about again. They get anxious and not going to succeed. And we shouldn't forget that the spinal injury can affect the whole family. Relationships, particularly marital relationships, sexual relationships, relationships with children or parents. And a psychologist is an invaluable part of the spinal team to help people cope with a major change in their life and their lifestyle. And then we have to consider the difficulties when returning home. And often after many weeks or many months in the spinal centre or other good quality spinal rehabilitation unit, people with spinal injury will nearly always be able to return home. But often the home will need adapting uh, to manage a wheelchair user, for example. There needs to be advice at that point about leisure interests and pursuits, what could be done now that your life and uh, your ability has changed somewhat. Driving, uh, driving is, is key to modern life and can be really helped uh, with a lot of driving adaptations that are common and, and easy to use and understand. We shouldn't forget about the importance of education for people whose studies have perhaps been interrupted by a spinal injury when they're young. And of course, advice about work, which can clearly change dramatically. So there's a lot we need to think about and help people uh, when they're thinking of returning home, returning back to the family and returning to their community. So in summary, spinal injury can cause a whole multitude of problems particularly physical problems, which can be handled and managed by the spinal team, but also emotional problems and problems for the family. But particularly, we need to remember that all these problems can be helped. People can be helped to cope and adapt to their change of lifestyle, their change of quality of life. And a good quality spinal rehabilitation unit can assist hugely with getting a person back to a good quality functioning and a good quality life as they possibly can. Thank you.